Welcome back to Murderlicious. I'm Lindsay. And I'm Lauren. And today we are going international, over to the UK, to tell you a story about a little girl named Mary Flora Bell. Mary was born May 26, 1957, to a 17-year-old sex worker named Betty. Betty and Mary lived in a rundown area in Scottswood, which is in Newcastle, and this was said to have been a very poor and dangerous neighborhood. Well, I don't know if it was dangerous, but it was a very poor neighborhood. <laughs> Betty, Mary's mom, was described by the internet and family and friends that really did not seem to like her much at all as unwed and mentally unstable. She later married a guy named Billy Bell, who got into trouble a lot with the law, and it's unknown if Billy was Mary's real father or not because they got married after she was already born. Betty was a real piece of work. She was said to have left Mary frequently with relatives or acquaintances, and one time it was even reported that she gave her to a random woman that she met on the street outside an abortion clinic. Some accounts from family members even say that Betty had tried to kill Mary multiple times during the first few years of her life. Mary suspiciously overdosed on drugs as a baby. So... These drugs were probably administered to her by her mother because it seemed impossible that a baby would be able or likely to take all those pills. There was one serious overdose reported where she had to even get her stomach pumped. And as a result of these overdoses, Mary had serious brain damage. Betty also was accused of throwing Mary out of a window, which resulted in damage to her prefrontal cortex where your decision-making occurs. There's also reports of her being choked by her, and later when Mary was five years old is when Betty started to prostitute Mary out to other men. Mary herself says that she was the subject of repeated sexual abuse, and Betty could have been suffering from Munchausen by proxy, but that's just speculation. Lauren, what's Munchausen by proxy? That's when... A parent or a caretaker kind of loves the attention that they get when the person that they're taking care of has accidents. So in this case, it would be Betty loves the attention from Mary's accidents. Or she really just wanted her dead. But nevertheless, she when she didn't kill her, she then decided to become her pimp and pimp her out <laughs> to her Johns or Bills or Billies or whatever they're called. As Mary got older, she had a reputation for theft, vandalism, and attacking other children, which we're going to get into in a second. She was described as a liar and disruptive. And we're not sure if this is a product of her upbringing or as a result of the brain damage or in her family genes. But anyway, Lauren, why don't you tell us what happened when Mary got a little older? On the afternoon of May 25th, 1968, which was the day before Mary's 11th birthday, some boys playing in an old abandoned house found the body of four-year-old Martin Brown dead in an upstairs bedroom. The boys were there looking for scrap wood and found Martin on his back next to a window with blood and saliva trickling down the side of his cheek and chin. They called out to construction workers outside and they raced up the stairs to retrieve him, but he was already dead by the time they got up there. One of the boys noticed Mary Bell and her friend Norma Bell, who was 13. They had the same last name, but they weren't related at all. Um, Coming up towards the house, and Mary said, shall we go up and squeeze through the boarded house to get up inside? Norma and Mary had followed the boys inside and had to be ordered out when the police arrived. The girls went to find Martin's aunt to tell her that there was an accident and that they thought it was Martin and that there was blood all over, even though there really wasn't. And then Mary said to the aunt, I'll show you where it is. There was no obvious cause of death, so it was assumed that Martin Brown had swallowed aspirin from a discarded bottle found nearby, but his cause of death was still officially open. The next day, which was Mary's 11th birthday, Norma's father caught Mary choking Norma's little sister and slapped her face and sent her home. And later that day, a local nursery school was vandalized and police discovered some really weird notes. We'll post these notes um on our instagram yeah so you can see them but one of them said fuck off we murder watch out and the other one said we did murder martin brown fuck off you bastard but they just spelled everything wrong so it was obviously written by a child so martin's aunt and mother her name was june were super bothered by mary and norma from the beginning 
Mary would always ask the aunt, do you miss Martin? Do you cry for him? Does June miss him? And they were always grinning. And one time, Mary knocked on the Browns' door and asked to see Martin. June, his mother, answered and said, No, pet. Martin's dead. (laughs) (laughs) And Mary said to her, Oh, I know he's dead. I wanted to see him in his coffin and was smiling. Two months later, around the end of July 1968, three-year-old Brian Howe disappeared. There was an immediate search, and Mary Bell told Brian's sister that he might be playing on a heap of concrete blocks that had been dumped out on a nearby vacant lot. Mary apparently asked the sister, whose name was Pat, Are you looking for Brian? He usually played close to home, and Mary and Norma offered to help search for him. They led Pat through the neighborhood and went to an industrial area, and Pat was really worried about Brian because of the mysterious death of Martin. So remember at this point, Martin Brown's death was still a mystery because he was assumed to have swallowed pills, and although Mary and Norma were acting suspicious about it, there really wasn't any evidence to call them suspects because, after all, there wasn't even evidence to say that he was murdered. So in the heap of concrete blocks that Mary and Norma led Pat to is where they found the body of Brian Howe. Brian was strangled, and his legs and stomach were cut with a razor. And an old pair of, like, rusty scissors were found by the police at the scene. And they they were said to have been used to scratch him and cut off some of his hair. And then also there were reports where his, like, genitals were mutilated too, right? Yeah. And then what about the initial carving? So... There's some speculation that the body was mutilated by different people because originally there appeared to be an N carved into his stomach and then later it was changed to an M by a different hand. That's some like really good detective work there. So when Brian's body was examined, a medical examiner suggested that the killer might have been a child since relatively little force was used to strangle him. That to me is like crazy. How would they know that? Obviously it was enough force to kill him. Yeah, maybe by, like, if there was bruising on his neck. Inspector James Dobson said, There was a terrible playfulness about it, a terrible gentleness, if you like, and somehow the playfulness of it made it more terrifying. So, at this point, the police launched an investigation where they interviewed all the children in the neighborhood. Norma and Mary each gave answers that were suspicious or evasive, and they were on their radar right away. Both girls were questioned several times and changed their stories twice. Investigators said that Mary was acting suspicious and Norma seemed almost excited. One authority even said that she was smiling like everything was just a big joke. As the investigation narrowed in on Mary, she suddenly remembered seeing an 8-year-old boy with Brian on the day that he died. She said the boy hit Brian for no reason and that she saw him playing with broken scissors. The boy that she accused had been at the airport on the afternoon that Brian died. And by revealing that she knew about the scissors, which was confidential evidence withheld by the police to the public, Mary basically implicated herself. She even described what the scissors looked like. When Norma was questioned again, she then claimed that Mary told her that she killed Brian and brought her to see his body at the blocks. Mary told Norma, I squeezed his neck and pushed his lungs. That's how you kill them. Keep your nose dry and don't tell anybody. And Norma said that when she saw the body, she knew that he was dead and that Mary ran her fingers along his lips and said that she enjoyed it. So basically, Norma rolled on Mary. (laughs) Snitch. They brought Mary Bell in that night and detectives said that she admitted to nothing and that nothing surprised her. Mary kept saying that Norma was a liar and tried to get her in trouble. Mary was clearly the more dominant personality among these two friends, with a very worldly attitude. Rudolph Lyons said, for example, when she was being questioned by a detective chief inspector about a charge of murder, she said to him, I'll phone for some solicitors. They will get me out. This is being brainwashed. Eventually, they let her go, but then this happened. Brian Howe was buried, and one of the detectives saw Mary standing in front of his house when the coffin was brought out, and he even saw her laughing and rubbing her hands, and immediately he thought, oh my god, I have to bring her in, she'll do another one. So then they brought Mary back in, and she gave her official statement. And we'll post her official statement on our Instagram so that you guys can read it for yourselves. Both girls were then arrested and charged with murder, and Mary said, that's all right by me. 
During their trial in December of that same year, Mary was confident and self-possessed. The court psychiatrist described her as intelligent, manipulative, and dangerous. Both girls admitted to breaking into the school and writing the notes that were found there. After nine days of evidence, Norma, who had appeared confused and overawed during the proceedings, was found not guilty. A psychiatrist who examined Mary testified that she showed signs of psychopathology or sociopathology. So no remorse, no tears, no anxiety, unemotional, and no criminal motivation. Based on this, the jury found Mary guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. But the judge described her as dangerous, saying that she posed a very grave risk to other children. So Mary was convicted of two counts of manslaughter and sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, which is really an indefinite imprisonment. Lauren, why don't you get into her life when she entered prison at age 12? (laughs) After spending eight years in young offenders institutes. So like juvie or like, like, yeah, I read somewhere and we'll post all of our sources in, in the um, episode notes and on our Instagram. But I did read that she, she was sent to an institution where she was the only girl and all the rest were boys. I did read that. That's interesting. After spending eight years in Young Offenders Institutes, Mary Bell was transferred to Moore Court Open Prison, where she escaped with a 21-year-old sex worker named Annette Priest during tea time. (laughs) (laughs) They hitchhiked and met two guys, and Mary had a love affair for three days with one of the guys who picked them up, and his name was Clive. Okay, I'm going to have a link in the description of this episode to the article that I got this from, but I'll read a little bit more about the love affair she had with Clive. So it says, Child killer Mary Bell was a tender lover with no hint of violence about her, according to the first man to bed her. Ex-con Clive Shirtcliffe shared three days of dramatic love on the run with Bell after she escaped from jail in 1977. He told the Sunday people there were no evil demons in her when we made love. (laughs) During her brief taste of freedom, Belle, then just 20, lost her virginity to Clive in a Blackpool boarding house, romped with him on a canal barge, and made love at his home while his mother slept next door. Oh, gosh. Now, 21 years later, Clive and his accomplice, Keith Hibbert, remember the incident as if it were yesterday. It was just after his own release from jail that petty thief Clive and Keith, whoa, (laughs) were driving to Blackpool and spotted two girls thumbing a lift in Staffordshire. Staffordshire. Thumbing a lift. Thumbing a lift. Hitchhiking? Hitchhiking. They had no idea that the dark-haired beauty was Mary Bell. Clive said that Mary seemed relaxed and it was quite a tender thing. The next day, as Clive went back to his mother's home for some clothes, police surrounded their car with Keith and Mary sitting in it. We knew the game was up then, said Keith. Mary put her hand on my shoulder and said, thanks for everything. Neither man has spoken to Mary Bell or seen her since. Both were arrested and given suspended sentences for harboring a criminal, but time hasn't changed their opinion of Bell. Clive said that he'd do it all again. Uh, 21 years on, I'm glad she's proved the authorities wrong and me right. Mary Bell's no danger to anyone. The home office stressed that she was no longer dangerous, and one of the quotes that we found... These news reports from back then are so funny. (laughs) Yeah, one of the reports that we read said, Bell killed some smaller children when she was 11 years old. Now she is 20, and prison authorities say that she is not the slightest bit dangerous. She's just a missing 20-year-old from an open prison. She once escaped prison to lose her virginity. So in 1980, she was released from prison. Uh, She was 23 years old and served 12 years. She was given a new identity and started a new life. Four years later, she had a daughter that was born on May 25th, 1984. And if you remember the day, May 25th, that was 16 years to the exact day that she murdered Martin Brown, her first victim. That's so crazy. Her daughter apparently had no idea about her mother's past until their location was discovered by reporters, and she and her mother had to leave their house with bedsheets over their heads. 
it's from 1998. It says, The child killer Mary Bell was last night in hiding after being hounded out of the seaside home where she had lived anonymously with her 14-year-old daughter. She was forced to flee after several tabloid newspapers tracked her her and her common-law husband down and set up camp outside her house. Bell is now in protective custody at a secret address. Bell's daughter had been unaware of her mother's previous convictions or former identity until the house was surrounded by journalists in the early hours of yesterday. Could you imagine your house being surrounded by all these reporters and like cops and and you're like, Mom, what is everybody doing here? And and she's like, Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, honey, I killed two little boys when I was little. Like, what? <laughs> Like, I can't even imagine, like, how that conversation went. Mary's daughter's anonymity was protected only until she was 18, but they were able to have that extended for life by the court. In 2009, Mary Bell became a grandmother at 51 years old, and her granddaughter's anonymity was also protected. It's really funny that, like, they're they're so anonymous, but yet we know all these facts. Right. (laughs) And, Lauren, why do we know all these facts? It's because she wrote a book, but I'm not allowed to say that because Lauren doesn't want me to promote that book. So you guys are going to have to Google it for yourself. (laughs) So a couple little fun facts about our friend Mary Bell. Two weeks before the first murder, Mary Bell and Norma were playing with a three-year-old boy who was said to be Mary's cousin on top of a Newcastle air raid shelter, and he fell and was severely injured. But the incident was written off as an accident, and later Mary admit that she pushed him. Well, I, I bet it's reported, like, that it could have been Mary's cousin because I'm sure his last name was Bell, too, because everyone in that neighborhood was named Bell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, the mother of three young girls informed the police that Mary had attacked and choked their children, and she was interviewed and lectured by authorities, but no charges were filed. So, Lauren, do you think that somebody who commits such heinous crimes should be allowed to be out of jail and living a full life i don't know i thought about this like throughout the whole research of this case and i don't know if she deserves the anonymity um i think her child and her grandchild do because they really had nothing to do with it but it it seems unfair that she only served 12 years and now she just gets to live a life um she wrote a book she's oh yeah she profited from telling her story but um these poor families they but on the yeah i feel horrible for the families but on the flip side i feel bad for her because she was she had a horrible life horrible upbringing and it's no surprise that she turned out the way that she did and it's actually amazing that she was able to get help and obviously was rehabilitated enough or convinced people that she was rehabilitated enough to deserve to be let go and live a normal life. I mean, we haven't heard any reports of any criminal activity. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that, like, a lot of it wasn't really her fault, but it just seems so weird to me that she could have done these things and now she just gets to live as a free person after only 12 years. Um, I feel like that's not really enough time. Yeah, but you're when you're only t- 11 or 10, wasn't she 10 when the first one happened? Um, it was the day before her 11th birthday. Yeah, so she was 10. She wasn't even 11 yet. Like, what do you, how responsible can you be for your own actions at 10? Like, do you really understand what death even is? Like, I think you know I think not the, to the, kill people. <laughs> I think the first one – Maybe, but after the first one, the second like, one. Girl, she carved an M <laughs> into his stomach. Yeah, that's and it's so terrible because these these and they were so little. They were yeah. so little. They were babies. Yeah. But there were reports of her being violent to Norma's little sister and her Mary's cousin, and so those it wasn't three girls that their parents went to the police. Yeah, so it's a good thing that she was caught when she was. Um, it's terrible that she wasn't caught sooner. It's terrible that nobody was paying attention, like social services, to take her away from her mother when she was being like prostituted out or when she had those overdoses and suspicious accidents. Yeah. 
that's terrible yeah I was gonna bring that up like do you think that it was okay that they kind of wrote off all of these things as accidents and they really didn't do anything like until she killed those two boys I mean I don't know if they necessarily could have done anything other than prevent her child abuse but well this shit would not fly in the states you know that like child protective services would be all over that like when I was younger and I had bruises on my legs because I had just learned how to walk the doctor asked me does your mommy ever hit you and I guess I told them yes like (laughs) and they called child services on my mom and my dad and like they had to well our dad and my mom and they like came to our house and everything like they there was like a report filed and everything and like I was only like one years old and also our brother you know who's a little bit older than me was like always just like shoving me around <laughs> so <laughs> but I mean I maybe the UK is is different and they don't have a child protective services I don't know I don't I don't want to blame the, her majesty for this <laughs> the queen <laughs> <laughs> um so another question I want to ask you is does the abuse like that she went through make you more empathetic or sympathetic or whatever towards what she did or are you still like does that not really matter no I think it does matter I've watched too many episodes of criminal minds yeah like for sure it matters I don't think that all I can say is that I'm not surprised that she that somebody with her upbringing did what she did yeah um I I think it's great that she was rehabilitated to the point where even the inspector gadgets or whoever it was <laughs> made statements to the press being like don't worry everybody she only <laughs> killed a couple kids <laughs> <laughs> she only killed a couple kids a long time ago <laughs> and she's only with a prostitute <laughs> like don't I worry um i also think that there's probably a lot more that we don't know because we have not read her book because Lauren won't let me <laughs> um, about what really happened to her when she was younger. And I don't even know if, you know, you, you got to take it with a grain of salt if you believe it or not. But she was a child killer. She was a baby killer as a – she was a child baby killer. Yeah. It makes it even crazier. And she was a serial killer. Like she did it – and she was like on some kind of war path. Like she did it like super fast – the cases were she was she what do they say on criminal she was escalating (laughs) (laughs) i know she like choked her friend and then pushed her cousin off a roof and then like and the first little boy a little bit and then the second little boy like cut off his genitals like it was like a very big escalation (laughs) (laughs) but also so like all of these little kids getting hurt and and they were ruled accidents at first it makes me wonder how long she had been doing this and how many other accidents there were before they were like, hmm, maybe these aren't all accidents. But then also it's like mirroring her mother's actions. Like her mom did accidents to her. So is this like learned behavior or is this like genetically in her blood to just be a piece of shit? I don't know. I also read somewhere that the family members' houses that Betty would leave Mary at, like they wanted to keep um, Mary because they didn't want her living with Betty. So – I wonder, like, why there wasn't more intervention from them. Yeah, if they were so suspicious at the time, why didn't they say anything to the police? Like, right. I think Mary was failed by the system, by the, by the queen. I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) No disrespect, Her Majesty. (laughs) But I think that it's a real tragedy that nobody helped Mary sooner because it's it was not. It was not her fault. But then, now that I think of it, Betty was only 16 when she had she Mary. She was 17, but yeah, she was basically a child herself. Right, and where was her mother? And she was a prostitute, so like, obviously, and she was living in a terrible neighborhood, so she was very poor and was doing what she, maybe, I mean, this is just a sad, it's, it's, it's generations of sadness and that is the story of mary flora bell we definitely want to know what you guys think about this case so please comment on our instagram at murderlicious podcast 
or send us an email to murderliciouspodcast at gmail.com. We want to say thank you to everyone who's been listening and sharing. We're very surprised and grateful for everyone and the amount of people who have listened to our first episode. So please subscribe or follow us wherever you're listening and give us a rating if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more from us. We also want to add that although this podcast is supposed to be a lighthearted and fun space for you all to listen about your favorite murderlicious topics and stories, we do recognize that these cases are about real people and real victims. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode, and we'll see you next week. (laughs) Okay, bye. (laughs)